Governor Tim Walz announced new COVID-19 restrictions that will be taking place this weekend for Minnesota. He is now taking questions from reporters. Let's listen in. You need to press star, then the number one on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to the speaker today, Mr. Teddy Sean. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Good evening, and thank you for joining the call. Today, we have Governor Tim Walls, Commissioner Jan Malcolm, and Commissioner Steve Grove available to answer questions. Just as a reminder, we ask each reporter to limit themselves to one question each so we can get to as many media outlets as possible. And we will have abbreviated remarks here just so we can quickly get into questions following the governor's live address. And with that, I'll hand it over to Minnesota Governor Tim Walls. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, for making some time. I, as uh, Teddy said, we've got Commissioner Malcolm, Commissioner Grove here to get into some of the granular details around uh, the pause that we're instituting. Um, I think many of you have seen uh, a little more detail around this. Probably also seen um, some of the uh, the healthcare providers and healthcare organizations that were adamant about a, a move that needed to be made. Um, and then I think Commissioner Grove may be able to talk to uh, some of the work uh, around the business community and one of the reasons that I uh, hit hard on and we've been working uh, pretty much nonstop with our federal partners and in conjunction with the other governors uh, to try and get a federal relief package moving. With that, I would certainly open it up for any questions. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star then the number one on your telephone. To draw your question, press the pound key. Your first question comes from the line of Kevin Featherly. Your line is now open. Um, I'm looking at the, the projections the, uh, uh, for Minnesota deaths by the, say, by March, and it says if the current projection is 6,724, uh, if there's universal masking, there would be 5,800. Um, you're taking these steps now, and, and yet we're getting a flurry of responses from the other side of the aisle, uh, Cal Barr saying you don't know what you're doing, uh, Senator Pratt saying that if the governor has evidence of the last lock, lockdown actually worked, that there's, th th that there's hard evidence show it. Um, we're just getting a flurry of criticism on this move. How do you respond to that? And, and uh, as a corollary to that, do you worry about losing two DFL members of the Senate? They're going to the independent column, but does that in any way worry you about what this might mean for the legislative response going forward? No, that's the last thing I worry about. The legislators can make up their own mind. What I would say about this, Kevin, is, is that these are folks from the beginning that did not believe the science around this virus. Um, it is very clear with the rates uh, – by states surrounding us, even with much smaller populations and without a large metropolitan area with the density that we saw, we had much better results, and that's proving out now that uh, these are the folks that we're saying, but your death rates are higher. They're much lower now than the surrounding states, the hospitalization rates, um, but they brought it here. And uh, these are folks that, again, gathered together unmasked, found the need to just uh, go on as business as usual. So my response to that is, I'm willing to work and want to work with anybody. There is not a single, if you can give it to me, if, if those senators show it, there's not a single person in the medical community in the state of Minnesota that agrees with their assessment. There's no one. So from a political perspective, um, I'll, I'll deal with the side that falls out there. My first concern is, is to follow the science, the data, and the evidence. And there's a reason that every other nation and many states that are starting to move are seeing this data, using it, and putting in very similar restrictions. Just very quickly, if I can follow up, uh, perhaps for um, uh, Commissioner Malcolm, are those projections the same ones that you're operating with, or are you, do you have more optimistic project projections for, uh, say, by March? Are we going to have fewer, potentially fewer than 6,700 deaths? Do you hope for that? Do you expect that? Uh, this is Commissioner Malcolm. We always hope for and work for um, preventing as many preventable deaths as we possibly can. I assume you're talking about uh, projections from IHME. Uh, exactly. There are many, many different models out there. Um, you know, theirs has, I think, gotten uh, more accurate as time has gone along. Um, we are optimistic that um, with the improvements in care that we've seen and, and if Minnesotans support these moves that we, we absolutely aim to prevent every avoidable death that we can and, and to beat these numbers. Thank you. 
Next question comes from the line of Jeremy Olsen from the Star Tribune. The line is now open. Jeremy Olsen from the Star Tribune, your line is now open. I'll shoot Jeremy a note. Let's go ahead and go to the next reporter. Next question comes from the line of Tom Hauser from KSTP TV. Your line is now open. Good evening, Governor. Uh, 23 years, uh, 23 days ago on October 26th, on a Minnesota Department of Health call, I asked you specifically about reports your administration was planning significant restrictions or shutdowns of bars, restaurants, fall and winter sports in mid-November. And you said, quote, none of that is correct and none of that has been discussed. Did none of your health experts see this coming even three weeks ago so that maybe Minnesotans could have been a little more prepared for what was coming instead of having it sprung on them two days before they go into effect? Well, it's not a spring on, Tom. And the fact of the matter is, is that no one in the, the medical okay. community, and I would, you know, put you onto that. I think you should probably call all of those healthcare systems in Minnesota. No, the answer was, and I showed a slide tonight, there was significant difference. And we don't rely just on our internal data. We're relying on our partners in the healthcare system, where they're at as far as beds and staffing. And at that point in time, there wasn't an intention to try and move because our goal has always been to try and walk that line between protection of public health and um making sure that those activities that people want to do. Um, on the 26th of October, as I said, Minnesota was down about in the middle of the pack on infection rate. Um, I don't think anybody today, of all the nations in the world, North Dakota counts as the worst nation in the world for uh, infections, and so does South Dakota. None of those things were true on the 26th of October. So we move where the data moves, and as we said, it is moving under our feet very quickly. Um, that includes the healthcare systems and many of their, and we look at many independent projections, um, and most of them were not predicting that, that top peak. We knew, and I've been talking about it for a long time, the potential was certainly there. But... Um, no, this moves very quickly. Um, we start to try and gather that data as quickly as we can. Um, we have been having uh, conversations every single day about uh, how we approach this and mitigation measures. But when you asked me the question on that day, there had not been a deep discussion um, around measures that would involve a dial back. As a quick follow-up, do you have a specific plan beyond asking the federal government for help to give financial aid to the thousands of Minnesotans who are likely to lose their jobs again just before the Christmas holiday season? Yeah, it's very difficult. States cannot run deficits, as everyone knows. Um, the federal government has grossly failed in their responsibility. I've been talking to our members of Congress, our senators, and our members uh, of, of the House. Um, that here in Minnesota, we put out $10 million last week in aid, especially targeted at those small businesses. Um, we will come back collectively together. But again, as you well know, it's the legislature that appropriates, not the executive branch. I would hope that some thought is being made around that. But um, we certainly uh, we certainly know that needs to be there. All 49 other governors are saying the exact same thing, that they don't have the capacity in the state. We do know that the state of Minnesota gave more of our CARES money to our counties and cities than any other state. And cities like I saw in Minneapolis is starting to put some of that out. So um, our intention is to continue to work on it. But um, let's be very clear. This is the federal government's major responsibility. They have failed at it. And I don't care whether it's the current administration or the incoming new administration. Congress needs to figure out how to make sure that that aid gets there. And I would settle for a scaled-down package that targets uh, small employers and uh, workers, um, uh, specifically around um, the closures in the hospitality industry. And that's what I'm asking for. If Steve Grove could just chime in on, is there money available for unemployment for these people who are going to be contacting you soon? Then I'll uh, hang up and listen. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Uh, yes, this is Steve. And, and they, uh, there is money available in our unemployment insurance system. Um, it is, of course, borrowing from the federal government at this point, like almost every state in the nation. But we are ready to take on any influx of applications we get as a result of this four-week pause. And, you know, I think the challenge is that, um, to the governor's point, the additional benefits that were there from the federal government earlier on in the pandemic, that $600 top-off, uh, the extended unemployment insurance for an additional 13 weeks, the unemployment insurance for 
uh, independent contractors and, and the like are all expiring at the end of this year. And um, in fact, many of them have already expired, for example, that $600 top off. So there's much less of a cushion for workers now than there was before. And it just highlights that need of the federal government to act. Um, but Minnesotans should rest assured that our state system is up and running well, and we're ready to help those who may need to come in on employment insurance as a result of, of the, this moment we're in. And uh, we'll be ready to help them out. UIMN.org is a link to uh, our website. Thank you all. Next question comes from the line of Catherine Richard from Minnesota Public Radio. Your line is now open. Sure. This message, uh, this question is for Governor Walls. Um, you know, just last week you were asking bars and restaurants to stop in person, dining and drinking at 10. Wedding receptions could still happen, but they needed to be smaller. You know, did you have any inkling in your mind last week that you would be issuing even stricter um, rules around these gatherings? This week, um, did anything happen in between then and, and now to spook you into making these decisions? Well, 52,000 new cases, which took us a long time to get to that, um, about 280-some deaths, um, yes, and, um, and some of the rates we were, we were starting to see. Yes, we had an inkling, and I think it's always trying to, to strike the right balance. There was a, a healthy debate amongst both inside the administration and, and outside that we should have taken more steps last week. I think at that point in time, um, it felt like the moves that we were making might be able to make uh, that difference. We're also in contact, and I think you know the the input we get back from the um, the impact that we get, and then the inputs we get from the healthcare systems is they were moving really quickly. I was on for about an hour and a half with Mayo's modeling team that is now spending a considerable amount of time not modeling the spread and, and potential, you know, trajectory, they were modeling the impact on their own workforce, the healthcare workforce. And that is something that had not been done before. And most of the healthcare systems had not been seeing that type of granular data around it. So I think it was a, a combination of starting to see that sense of urgency. And you'll see it in the the statements of many of our healthcare folks that that's happening across the country, ratcheted up very quickly. And if I could just follow up to maybe this is a question better for Commissioner Malcolm. How do you guys land on this one month period? And how will you know it's okay to dial uh, ahead? I guess I'm not sure what the right terminology is on December 18th. Like, what do you need to see for things to start to reopen again then? Governor, would you like me to take that one? Yeah, go ahead, Jan. I think, you know, it, it's a great question on the metrics, and um, please go right ahead. Yep, thank you. Well, just to also build on the governor's last point about what changed so suddenly, I mean, we, we went, we've had an 80% increase in hospital admissions in the last two weeks and a daily average of 220 admissions each day just last week. So as, as the governor said, re things really did move quickly between last week and this week. So what will, the reason for four weeks um, is two kind of two incubation cycles or two, two generations of potential transmission. We've learned um, over these months that um, it's good to give a full four weeks to measure the impact of something. And as the governor has reinforced many times, What's going to happen in the next couple of weeks is already the dire cast, so to speak. I mean, these cases are already in the pipeline. People have already been infected. The current cases are going to end up in the hospital, a percentage of them. So we know that things are going to get worse for the next couple of weeks. Um, the, the hope for positive impact of these moves um, should show up in, in, in the three- and four-week time frame. So we're going to hope to see our um, admission rates stabilize and come down our case growth on a, how many new cases do we have per day per 100,000 people. That's a critical metric that um, kind of we compare ourselves to others, and that's the measure on which the governor said we were in pretty good shape two weeks ago, uh, and now we're in the top 10 uh, rapid case growth states uh, on that metric. So we want to see the average uh, cases per day per population come down. We want to see our percent of tests coming back positive come down. We're at 15.3% now, test positivity. We've been that high before last April, but um, back then we were testing literally a, a tenth 
of, of the people that we're testing now. So the fact that we're testing so many people and still finding this degree of increasing test positivity is another one of those signals. So if test positivity stabilizes and starts dropping, that will be a very good sign. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Larson from Flag Family Media. Your line is now open. Thanks, Governor Walls, for taking time with us this evening. My, my question is for you and for Commissioner Grove. Small businesses of Minnesota, they're in dire straits right now. The additional restrictions announced today will mean more of them will go out of business. One, Governor, your, your reaction to that thought? Um, and two, for both you and Commissioner Grove, what is the plan of the state government to help them from hopefully keeping from going out of business. Yeah, and I was, thank you for the question, Chris. As I said, it, it, this issue around small businesses absolutely pains me. I, I think we need to be clear with the rates of infection we have, um, there's not gonna be people to go to the restaurants. There's not gonna be people to go. And what we do know is, is whether there's restrictions or not, once you reach a case positivity rate in states like this, there's virtually no difference because people aren't going anyway. Um, so what I know is, and what I've been saying, when we're asking these people to make these changes to protect their neighbors, to protect the hospitals, this false narrative that was started by the federal government in many cases that did not have a plan and just pushed it back on the state, this is not a choice between the economy and the health. There's no economy to go back to if we don't get a handle on where this is headed. Um, and so what I've been saying is that these folks are being heroic, doing what's asked of them. Every other nation on earth provided their businesses the support necessary to make the right choices, and they got a handle on it. And guess what? They've lost less people, the businesses are working again, and their economy is coming back. Unlike here, where we're mired in this and has continued to go on, that has made it incredibly challenging. So my heart breaks for them. The, as I said tonight, it is grossly unfair uh, of what's happening to them because these are the businesses where COVID spreads the most. And we have done, whether it was moving um, CARES Act money, whether it was helping support and get the first stimulus bill through, but now every single economist and every single governor is saying the only way you get through this thing and the only way you, you stop the spread is by giving small businesses the help that they need right now so that folks can stay home. So, Steve, you want to take in? Yeah, Governor, I think that's exactly right. I'll just, I'll just echo that. I mean, we have been on calls with business leaders all day today, of course, and really every day of the last uh, several months on these topics, and we know how devastating today's news is in the, in the short term. And uh, it is clear that you're right. There are businesses that won't make it through the end of the year, and that's a devastating thing, and, and consumer confidence is at all-time lows, and um, we need to have the workers and the demand there to sustain our economy. But I think one thing that's important to understand, and the governor mentioned these economic uh, models, when you look at what the IHS market report has showed to us in terms of long-term job growth for our state, they put out a couple different scenarios. One is a baseline assumption where, you know, a vaccine comes um, and we continue to mitigate the virus, which has us gaining back a lot of our jobs by the end of 2022, the jobs that we lost since the pandemic began. But if unmitigated spread continues and you have a major rise in cases and crumbling consumer confidence, that projection of job recovery goes out a full year beyond that, well into 2023. And so, you know, obviously the, the, the core uh, component of this move today is to protect our public health, but there's a long-term economic recovery component to this that's really essential. And, uh, you know, in the short term, we need Washington to act. We're going to continue to get all the state assistance we can out the door, um, but it's limited, and, and that federal help is just going to be really essential. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Dave Arik from Pioneer Press. Your line is now open. Thank you. I've got a couple of clarifications on some of these things. Um, construction projects like in the home, ongoing renovations, things like that, uh, self-interest, uh, I happen to have one going on right now. Can that continue? This is Steve. Uh, yeah, the, the construction and manufacturing and, and those industries can continue. Of course, masking up and staying socially distant is, is critical, but those industries were not affected by today's order. 
Okay, thanks. Um, as far as enforcement on the social gatherings, Governor, do you acknowledge that this is essentially one that is is largely unenforceable, but you're just sort of pleading for compliance with? Yeah, I and I'm not afraid to say that, Dave. That I, I ask Minnesotans, I need them to protect their neighbors. The the facts are there. I mean, I'm I'm still stunned when the response in the first few minutes, as one of the earlier questions asked, that um, we've got legislators who simply refuse to believe this. And that's what tells people they didn't need to wear a mask. They don't need to do this. Um, I'm just begging people and, and, and asking for them that we know what works. We know we can make a difference. And I think a lot of people simply, you know, and part of this is, is just to inform them. So what can I do? What's really risky? We have got to get to the point on public health that it is so grossly irresponsible for people in positions of authority to put out verifiably false information about what the science says around controlling a pandemic. And what I'm trying to do is to give them good information, to make sure that they know this is real, this is what you can do, this is what will be able to help. But yeah, as I've said, I'm not going into someone's house on Thanksgiving, but here's the thing. If you're gathering with a whole bunch of people, not in your family on Thanksgiving, you're really speaking volumes about what what the values are here in Minnesota. And I know it's hard. It's hard for me. So um, I once again am just asking people that we know this works. We know it can make a difference and we need to do it. Thank you. And um, last question, what is the rationale for uh, not closing pro uh, and college sports, but shutting down all the other uh, sports? Yes, yeah, Steve, do you want to take that? Because of, again, there's a great inequity here. Mm -hmm. I, I get that. And some of that inequity is like so many of these things, it comes with money um, and what they're able to do. But, Steve, you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, um, it's a great question. You know, professional sports are our workplaces. We sometimes forget that. They're not just entertainment venues and places to congregate, but the, the athletes and the, um, the professionals there are – are, are workers. And so while fans are not allowed in professional sports, uh, as we've discussed, the, the games themselves can continue to play. College is under the jurisdiction of those, of, of those, um, those governing bodies. And so, uh, but again, you see no fans that will be congregating for, uh, for those games too. So um, it's tough because these are the things that we love to watch and, and partake in, um, but they're just very different in this, in this COVID world. I'm sorry, just I didn't hear you explain. Is the spread not as risky in in both of those venues universally? Steve, it's more contained is what the situation is. They're testing every single person. As I said about the inequity of this, we're not testing every single high school athlete and we're not uh, – you know, basically uh, keeping them in a pod uh, close together. We're not keeping the coaches all working together, testing two or three times a day. And so the ability to control this and the mitigation efforts that they put in place are vastly different. Thanks. The next question comes from the line of Danny Spivak from CARE 11 Television. Your line is now open. Governor, one of the most common questions we're getting uh, from people, whether it's restaurants and bars, uh, high school sports, gyms, they're looking at the number of cases connected to the outbreak. They're seeing, for example, 780 cases with sports. Uh, when you look at the more than 200,000 cases statewide since this began, uh, people seem to not be grasping why exactly um, you know, you're targeting certain industries or, or looking at those industries for the restrictions. Can you just walk us through that process of why you chose uh, – these specific types of uh, gathering spots and sports, gyms, restaurants, weddings, um, to make the decision for these newest restrictions? Yeah, I'll let Jan do it in a bit more detail. I, I just want to be clear when you're reading those numbers. For every one of those 780, the second and third effect infections that will happen equal about 70. So you can take the 780 times 70 to get to where those are coming from. These are also known infection rates, granted, we are now at a point because of widespread community spread that many of them are coming from um, many of them are coming from uh, unknown sources. That doesn't mean they're not coming from some of these, but what we know is, and the reason we're focusing on these, is we do know that the predictability of the activity is leading to more of those uh, cases. So these are activities and these are places because of the the amount of exposure the nearness to the exposure, the unmasked, and the time that you're unmasked, those are the places where it's happening more. And so the case numbers, and Jan, you could explain that in a little more detail, 
while it appears like that's a very tiny number, it's not a very tiny number, and it has had a an impact on how much of this spread. And then think about that. Each one of those 70 that came out of each one of those 780 spread it to someone else that might be considered a community spread, but this is where we're seeing it. Governor, that was great. I, there's not much I need to add to that. It, the, the, and that is the problem with just focusing on the uh, the numbers. And, and I'll also say that these are just, the, as the governor said, the primary cases, the first case that we can attribute with some certainty to a specific setting. Um, and, and when we count something as associated with an outbreak, there's a certain threshold. We don't even start counting until there are a certain number of cases from different households uh, associated with these different settings. So the, this is a, those numbers are, to begin with, a, a very significant undercount. And then as the governor, I think, did a good job of explaining, it's not only that primary case, it's who the primary case spreads to, and then they spread, and then they spread. And I think that's something that in the modern day, we've maybe lost a little bit of, of track of how, you know, how a pandemic works and, and what it means when you get to exponential growth, when um, you know, one person spreads it to three and those three spread to three, and that's how you get to a multiplier of 70 by the fourth generation of transmission. And um, we're well on our way to that right now. So we could do the math on any of these settings um, and, uh, and, and that's what we would expect to see over time. Just my one follow-up is I know early on in the pandemic with the stay-at-home order, there was some modeling that showed exactly how much contact would be limited based on the, you know, the mitigation efforts. I guess, does the health department have any data that shows that if we take these steps, it'll reduce social contacts by X percentage? We are, um, the, I think you're referring to the model that the University of Minnesota developed with our health department. Um, and they, they've continued to work on that. We, we don't have any new, um, new, uh, projections to share because it, it's actually not a projection type of model. It's, it's really meant more for uh, simulations of impact of different things. But um, uh, an earlier question asked about the, the IHME model, and uh, they did share with the governor uh, just a little bit earlier some of, some of their projections of what difference, um, you know, mask wearing at, you know, as close to universal mask wearing as, as we could get um, and the difference that that would make in our uh, the, the, the daily number of cases, I mean, and the, and the IHME model shows that unmitigated, if we just kind of continue on um, as we are with no further mitigations, we could expect to hit 20,000 cases a day um, by, you know, early in the, in the new year, around January. Um, whereas if we, if we can really implement all of these measures and achieve, you know, a, a big reduction in contacts and, and uh, closer to universal mask wearing, uh, we could drop that number down, you know, below 5,000 cases a day. And I'll just say, you know, about two weeks ago, I thought a 5,000 case day was horrific. And now that looks like a good day. So that's that's kind of, again, how, how quickly things have moved. Operator, we have time for just one more question today. Uh, next question comes from the line of Courtney Godfrey from Fox 9. Your line is now open. Uh, quick question, because I didn't hear this um, from the NPR uh, question, which was along the same lines. Should our uh, should Minnesotans expect that at the end of this four weeks we will revert to where we are now, or will we see a phasing in like we did last time? Well, thank you for the question. The data will drive our decision on that. And as I said, with uh, my hope is, and I know it's a little bit, I, I think it's okay to dream a little bit here. I think there's the potential by the time we get to the end of this four weeks that we're into a vaccination protocol that is starting to happen. That will start to impact that. We'll see what kind of impact that we've made um, by these changes. And, and just to be very clear, these changes will not have any impact whatsoever if Minnesotans don't do them. And I think that question kind of got asked earlier. We need them to do it. So the, the kind of the those who said you've tried this before and it didn't work. My favorite was the people who don't wear masks and say your mask mandate didn't work. No, it didn't work as maybe as well as it could have if we would have got 95% instead of 65% compliance. So we'll take a look then. Um, as the commissioner said, it, it's two incubation periods, if you will. And our data now after eight months shows if we're going to see some of this impact, which we did all along. There's a reason that we were at 5% 
Then the Dakotas were at 30%, and Wisconsin was at 30%, and Iowa was at 30% before us because we were making those measures. And so now we'll get to see if that happens. Commissioner Malcolm, really quick, do you have numbers? How many cases exactly have been linked to restaurants and how many have been linked to sports? Um, well, yeah, in terms of the, what we were talking about, about the, the, the method here, depending upon um, how you attribute to a specific outbreak, um, the most current data, and it is, it is um, data that's about a, a week old in the case of, uh, of bars and restaurants, I think we, what, what meets our outbreak threshold, which is five cases from five different households, um, it's about 3,600 cases from uh, bars and restaurants. And the uh, sports data, I'm just going to try to pull that up. This is a little bit older data. Uh, looks like um, just under just about 7,200 cases attributed to, to sports. And I just would make the point on the sports numbers, um, those Th those are, again, primary cases only and um, only associated with the actual uh, sports event itself. But one other thing we know about the, about the sports cases is it's not only the, 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 uh, the game or the practice, it's the social activities that tend to accompany that. Um, so the, the, the true picture of, of what sports are contributing, if you will, to the spread is uh, is not just the games itself, but the activities that tend to go around those gatherings. Well, thank you all. I'd, I'd like to make just two final comments. Earlier this week, I was talking to that emergency room physician in West Central uh, Minnesota, and, and I think the implications and those who say we should just do nothing, what it meant was is at the point where we're at now, even though the mitigations that we're taking before tonight, um, this emergency room physician said she had a patient came in, checked in, and while they're waiting in the emergency room, they had a heart attack because they had to wait nine hours because of the COVID cases that were ahead of them overrunning that hospital. And for those who say that this is just going to run its course, I, as governor of Minnesota, refuse to have a situation that looks like El Paso, Texas. Today, there were 175 families lining the streets outside of freezer trucks because there's 175 bodies in there with no place else to go. This is the end game of this. It is not It is not debatable. It is not maybe we'll get lucky. If you don't do these mitigations and you do not put in the things necessary, both to protect the workforce in those hospitals, their PPE, their bed space or whatever, you are going to end up with a situation where we have to ethically triage who gets care and who doesn't. You will have people in the hallways like you saw already starting in Minnesota with this gentleman who couldn't get in in time to have his the care that he needed. And so I understand very clearly the restrictions, and I understand the pain, especially around youth sports. But I'm not going to play another eighth-grade football game at the risk of a gentleman dies from a heart attack because we didn't do what we could do to reduce the numbers of folks flooding that room. Um, this data is out there. The United States has, has done this as poorly as I continue to say as any nation on earth. There are models out there that work, and these mitigation efforts, if Minnesotans do them, will give us a fighting chance to get to the virus and get on the other side of this. So I want to thank you all and uh, have a good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation.